sorry, I was muted. Thank you, uh, Natasha, for that great introduction. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, I was really disappointed that I didn't get to go out to Utah um, in person, but I hope everybody's staying safe. Um, it's a real honor, and I'm very excited tonight. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and get started so we can stay on time. I'm going to read first from um, A Tongue in the Mouth of the Dying. And uh, I wasn't planning on reading uh, Ode to El Cabrito, but I will. It will be my first poem. <laughs> Ode to El Cabrito. More than sheep and cow and butterfly, I love you. No envy between us like the rooster footed. In your belly, I live like warm milk, goat thick and cloud heavy. Lick you from the inside until the slaughter, when your mother cries like my mother. When fire sends its last breath to the stars, I tear away your muscle, bubbling fat, and warm tortillas over coal. In the onion and cilantro, you do not recoil like the burnt skin of the pig, but spread yourself, sunbather. The rest of you still on the spit, gap-mouthed, your fleshless head tossed back. You love being loved. In the sweet meat of you, little hooved, little horned, I taste my own skin. Um, in one of our classes, I don't remember if it was yesterday or today, I think it was yesterday, um, one of your students, Natasha, mentioned how much we were talking about the food, all the food in, my, in this first collection. And then my second also. Um, uh, yeah, it's really been, um, it's really an important part of my experience, I think, and it's how I experience the world with all of my senses. Um, the first book poem in this book, uh, Preparing the Tongue, is about preparing a lengua for a meal. Um, but it's so much more. The lengua represents so much. And so it's separate from all the rest of the poems because it acts for me as a a meditation. This is preparing the tongue. In my hands, it's cold and knowing as bone. Shrouded in plastic, I unwind its gauze mummy-like. Rub my wrist blue against the cactus of its buds. Were it still cradled inside the clammy cow mouth, I should want to enchant it. Let it taste the oil in my skin, lick the lash of my eye. What I do instead is lacerate the frozen muscle, tear the brick thick cud conductor in half to fit a ceramic red pot. Its cry reaches me from some heap of butchered heads as I hack away like an ax murderer. I choke down the stink of its heated moo, make carnage of my own mouth at garlic. Um, we also, I also encourage the students, uh, my own students as well, to keep a dream journal. And uh, we spoke a little bit about um, how often, for me anyway, my, a lot of my poems come from dreams. And uh, in, the, in the practice of keeping a dream journal, um, there was one that came out just almost completely done. And um, we were talking, I was talking with your students about it yesterday, Natasha. Um, this one's called Morning Praise of Nightmares 2. When the steak knife fiddled against the sinew of my gut, I heard the slow whine, felt each ridge, felt the simmering red erupt like the juice of an overripe plum, the, tri the tickle of nectar running down the body still warm from the sun. And from the kitchen to the street fair, as it often is in dreams, children laughing, a clown, the color yellow, Balloons melting against the burned sugar of the skin. And guns, tiny, like from gumball machines, in tiny hands. Bullets red and green and gunmetal blue piercing the skin like bot flies, their metal heads in deep until the offspring that winged blood gently and timidly took flight. And then the peeling of my skin. Who was that crafter whose face I never saw? That paper maker, his teacup hands, his clothespin fingers, rinsing clean the lace of my forearms, the squared off torso, long sheet of leg, 
thick bit of finger and toe like strips of bacon strung up, decorating that red room like black and white photos, developing mountains or smiles or sex. I could taste my own blood though I couldn't lift my hands to finish the job, put myself out of misery. I was but remains, a piled heap of slop on the floor of a house I never shared a meal in. Even my eyelids were gone and my spine exposed. I was an afterbirth without the birthing, a too early puppy whose whole pink body thumped with each beat of his slow heart. This is my morning praise of nightmares. Open your eyes. I hear three mouths whisper against the flower of my skull. Mama, open your eyes. Wooden box. He demands this, nothing else. No mahogany slick or roses kissed by lilies, no music or speech, weeping limited. We are to file down the aisle, nod head to his dead body, return home to care for things still living. We are not to sob for the child him, the bed and alphabetless picker of cotton, potatoes, tomatoes, follower of crops. We are not to sob for the cactus man, vaquero, lover him. Grandpa who takes his milk from the moon, who knows the time for cookie, the time for wine, no. When he is gone, he will be gone. I can make the box myself, he says. I can make it myself. <clears throat> I have a series of poems in this first book. I think it's two, well, it's two poems um, called Sundays After Breakfast. And um, that was the time when I would sit with both sets of grandparents, um, uh, Sundays after breakfast, after Barracoa Tacos, uh, and they would tell their stories. Um, and um, and so I, there's two in this, I'm gonna read them both. This one's called Sundays After Breakfast, A Lesson in Speech. There were no names for men like that. Gringos who stitched up their rules, their white garb, laced snug the issues of the day. Lord didn't make us to mix with them folk, they said. But God's got nothing to do with the black boys dumped still alive into a restless river. God's got nothing to do with having to tell their mamas. That bloody water ran through each dark vein across Texas, fed the Gulf all its brown-skinned people. This, Grandpa could name, Los Cuerpos, bodies swaying above the cotton like sheets on a line. No importaba que no eres negro, pero que no eres gringo. No, it didn't matter that you weren't black, Grandpa says pushing himself from the table, but that you weren't white. He lived his life this way, silent like every man after him, opening his mouth only to eat, holding his head above the cotton between white men and black boys. Sundays after breakfast, a lesson in cotton picking. It was a kind of dance, feet shuffling in dust, fluttering hands like birds nest building, blood staining brown birds red, cotton sacks 12 feet long dragging behind like a tongue, fat and slow as sun, I watch him Slow weep of his eye, remembering the girl who'd name and nurse nine children. He picks my grandma by the color of her dress, her eyes, and because she's lucky, not by how much cotton she can pick. Uh, I'm gonna move on to um, my crown of sonnets. So this is a uh, crown for Gomesindo. And uh, this book is a, a heroic crown of sonnets 
that I wrote after the passing of my grandfather. Um, it was published in 2015. I won't read the entire crown. I'm only going to read three sonnets from it. Stone fruit. So I'm, in, I'm reading numbers 10, 11, and 12. Good, I would ask. Good enough, you'd say, of the wine we made from plums. Didn't we for years tend the mother tree? Didn't we for years prune, pluck, hold in our hands the purpled bodies bursting that begged me next, have me? Weren't we so nourished in the nerve? Someone is buying our tree. You are reduced to pit. I put seed in dirt, wait for you to come back to me in a jar by the window. You are not growing. Aren't you a plum? Little red, little kidney, little mouth calling, singing, I'm here, I'm here. I thought the dirt would give you something to take hold of. I've buried everything I've ever loved. 11, casketing. I've buried everything I've ever loved in the bone of reason. Now, even in dreams, you are dead. Sometimes I wheel your metal-colored coffin to the grocery store, once to a papery, twice to Fiesta Bakery on Pleasanton. You are heavy. Once I was in high school in a play and parked you stage left. Always I shake you. Wake up, damn you. Sometimes the casket is open and I kick you. And when in my small shoes I make contact, your ribs crumble like the bark of an old mesquite. Wake up, wake up. We can't run the numbers. Argue, make your mother's bread if you are always going to be dead. Number 12, untouchable. If you are always going to be dead, who then will melt away the breasts from my chest? Need more my eyes than the unraveling of my hips. In your house, I was all bedrock and teeth, cutthroat, stopped clock, just as much man as woman or rain. You were blind and I loved you for it. In your house, my shoulders grew to fit the work. Patience blossomed upon my head, a crown. You were my mirror, my name, ready plum of my right hand, my ancient and rivered neck, my compass, my wing, my open gate, my warrior, my sleepless legion, as if I had been born male. My kingdom come, and one day in hot July, my kingdom gone. Those are always hard to read. <laughs> um, I'm going to share some new work. How are we doing on time? I forgot to set my time. <laughs> Let's see. Um say another um, five to seven minutes. Okay. Um, hmm, let's see. Okay. This is from the, the uh, I have it working on a new collection called Red Work, but I have a new and selected coming out and this, these are in the new and selected. Um, the new and selected is called I Have Eaten the Rattlesnake. This poem is called On Eating Rattlesnake. I remember it only once. I was small. Maybe it was the one my father shot off the front porch. Maybe it wasn't. The men stood around the fire. The women sat inside. I snaked around the men, hiding myself. Slitherer. I have seen it many times. The long stripping, one fist pulling skin, the other pulling flesh. And how the kills were celebrated. Rattles and skins hung like tapestries the innards left to wild things. When it was passed around hot from the fire, the women did not partake. I dug in, wild with curiosity. There was nothing more unashamed than a rattler, 
no apology in its tongue. It would never be cute. I had to eat it. I had to know this. Um, I'll read two more. On eating rabbit. I remember it only once. I was small. I don't know where it came from, who skinned it, how it was caught, but that, but that I had only ever held one in my hands. I was four and loved it despite its inability to love me back. I wanted and did not want to hold it. Such indifference in its eyes, its wanting to be left alone, unable to transform itself to lion or wolf. This is the way of the rabbit, little bunny, the misunderstood, misrepresented by fluff and cottontail. Its work had nothing to do with me. Nothing to prove the rabbit would rather die. I had to eat it. I had to know this. And this is the last one I'll read. It's called The Plight of Lovers. You came to my body in my wildest grief, drunk in it. I welcomed you. There were catastrophes I needed to explore. You contained them all. When you lap the well of my blood, milky and flowing near the river and the sugarcane fields, you drink to my mother and her mother and hers and the lovers each they had. This is the dowry, and this is the lot. The only child I will give you is myself. Be worthy, I have eaten the rattlesnake. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. It's so odd to read and not have any applause. <laughs> I'll talk for myself. <laughs> right. Yay. <laughs> so uh, please. Uh, ask your questions in the chat, which you can do through um, the box at the bottom of the screen that says chat. So write something and I'll, I'll get us started. I'm, I'd like you to talk about how poems come to you. How, how do you start them? Do you give yourself assignments? Um, you know, how, what are some typical ways that you begin to write? Um, it, you know, it's always changing. Um, but lately, um, you know, I, sometimes I give myself, you know, prompts. Uh, sometimes, you know, my girlfriends give me prompts. Um, but, I think that I've, I've gotten to the point where I'm, I know that I'm constantly ruminating on something there, and right now, especially, um, but there are things that I've carried that we carry in our bodies all through our lives. And, and what I'm, what I've learned in the last three years, two years that I've been working on this book, three years that I've been working on this current book, um, I just couldn't there you know something it's like uh it's like something pierces me or, or there's a, a a prick of some sort and it just starts coming out but it's not new it's something that i have carried and carried and carried and carried for years um so it can often be a a word somebody says or a tone somebody uses or something i see on tv um or, or a situation i find my kids are in that i've been in before and they should not be in this situation um, this should not be happening again. Uh, so things like that. I just feel like it's, I feel like my history is starting to, to bubble up, like my personal history, not just my social and familial history. So there are a few comments, not questions on the chat. Um, and I'm going to read them. And actually, we do have a question, but let me just read some of these comments um, from Jonathan Duncan. This is really beautiful. Thank you. From Rodriguez, amazing work, Lorianne. Um, from Maury Heffley, no questions, just a sincere thank you for sharing. Um, and from, from Georgie Donovan, 
You mentioned the senses and taste seem significant, but I wonder about taste in your experience and work uh, and sense we've been and and sorry, work a sense we've we've maybe lost. Taste? You mentioned taste of uh, the senses and tastes seem significant. I didn't do a good job of reading that, sorry. You mentioned the senses and taste seem significant, but I wonder about taste in your experience and work, a sense we've maybe lost. Um, I'm not sure if I understand the question. I don't know if, if the person means, if they mean a sense of taste in our writing or, or just in our person. Uh, I meant smell. Sorry, Georgie, do you want to ask the question? Yeah, you can unmute yourself, Georgie. And ask. <laughs> I mean, to me, just ask me. <laughs> I have a, I wonder if what Georgie means is that uh, food in, in the U.S., thanks to agribusiness, uh, is less flavorful. I, is that it, Georgie? Well, um, you'll have to ask Bob because it's, okay. <laughs> it's my question and it comes from uh, some things I've read and, and what uh, some students have said this week that smell is important to them. Mm. That we've become a very visual culture, but that other senses have been maybe lost and there's been some great tastes in, in the poetry this evening, but smell I, I would think is part of an uh right yeah that's an interesting um observation i think i mean ab absolutely i think we're sort of bombarded with visuals um um so yeah maybe 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 we have lost a little bit of that um i mean maybe and maybe that's why i hold it so dear i mean i never really thought about it but smells absolutely you know um I mean, just mentioning that, I, 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 the other day I walked out of my house and I was going to run errands and I, I just got this whiff of my mom, like her perfume. And I mean, it just took me back uh, to a time. And, and I called her immediately. Um, and she, you know, of course she's like, well, that's, you know, the universe is telling you, you, you need to come see me, you need to call me more. <laughs> um, but but those moments that we have throughout our day when we're sort of, I guess we need to pay more attention to that, the smells around us and even the sounds of not necessarily music or, you know, media, um, but what's happening in our, in our neighborhoods, you know. I'll be selfish while other people type questions and, and kind of press you a little bit on smell and colonization. On your first collection, you know, there is that, um, that going back and forth between both the visual and the sounds of cooking <laughs> and also um, our relationship uh, for those of us who are um, part of the diaspora and those of us who are, you know, well, it, about colonization. Um, and I wonder if there's, um, what is there a mystery between that connection between food, especially in the Americas and the way that we, you know, colonize and um, make profit of, and also an act of decolonization, right? Like, what does that, what does that relationship between a cabrito and cooking the cabrito and seeing and thinking about the way the pork sizzles and a cabrito doesn't sizzle? Um, um, I wonder if there's something there that I can't quite put a finger on, but it has to do with that smell and, and language and the language that cannot be captured in words. Not really a question. I want you to tell me more. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, that's a really, that's interesting. Um, I mean, you know, I had never really, I mean, obviously I chose, right, the line is the burnt skin of the pig. I mean, and just the sound of that line um, has tension in it, right? So, yeah, I mean, maybe subconsciously there was that sense of, you know, I mean, cabrito is such a beautiful word, cabrito, you know, um, and I don't say goat, I say cabrito. <laughs> um, I don't know. I mean, that's really interesting. I think I have to think about that some more. Yeah. Thank you. Um, there is uh, another comment, at least for uh, from Cassandra uh, Perry. Uh, at least for me, one reading is never enough. I agree. I feel honored to begin encountering these beautiful poems tonight. I enjoy your wanting to identify with the rabbit and the rattlesnake. I would like to hear you talk 
more about needing to embody the, those creatures, if I interpret correctly. Yeah, um, you know, those, those two poems are very, um, are perfect examples of, of something that I'd carried in me for a really long time. Um, those are probably, gosh, maybe my two most recent poems. I mean, I wrote them maybe a year ago. Um, I mean, that are ready to share. So, so I, I think when I, I was, yeah, I was in a very difficult place recently, the last couple of years, and, um, and, and I, I spent a lot of time thinking back, reminiscing um, to my childhood because the land, the land that I grew up on is, was in my family for generations and generations and generations. And, and my family is Tejano um, and that land has always belonged to us. And um, la, in the summer, last summer, my father finally sold the last bit of that land. And so I lost my connection to it. And so thinking about that and going through that and not really having the, I was very busy at the time and not having the space to sort of be on the land and say my piece with it and have, you know, um, my time there. I remembered these things from when I was little. And that sense of being the only girl in the family, feeling silenced, um, knowing that I was going to have a much harder time in the world than my brothers, um, and really just watching from the outside, uh, knowing that I was part of the land. And so no matter where I went on the earth, like it wasn't so much that I had lived on that land, but that land lived in me. And part of that were the creatures that roamed that land. And so the rabbits and the rattlesnakes and the scorpions and the spiders too. Um, but I've always had this connection with the rattlesnake and the rabbit. Thank you, that was beautiful. Um, um, from Ranja and Adiga, what advice, what advice do you have for young poets and writers when attention spans are getting shorter and it's easy to get distracted by social media? Writing needs patient patience and his very private experience get off social media that's my best advice um i know that that's the way of the world now um but i i i think that we're losing a lot and when and and i was on facebook for years and years um and i've been off of facebook now for a year and a half i think um and I, I still have a Twitter, but for some reason, Twitter is different. And I use it just to like spy on my daughter. <laughs> um, but, um, but, but when I got off of social media, I mean, I, I mean, because I'm older, I'm not a millennial. I was able to sort of look objectively at what was happening in my life because of, um, because of social media. Um, and when I got off of it, I realized I could see in my students, I could see in my own children, um, just how consumed they were by it because I had been too. Um, and when I got off of it, I started really seriously writing again. And it's, you know, when we are, when we have so much, so many voices that belong to other people in our heads, it's very easy to lose your own voice. Um, and that, you know, media on top of, you know, the, the daily things that we have to deal with, work, school, parents, children, um, it's very easy to lose your voice in that. And I think for me, um, I had to step away from everything and everyone that was in my head so that I could hear my own voice. And you know, it's funny, one of my favorite poems is The Journey by uh, Mary Oliver. And um, one of the lines in, in there is, um, is um, there was a new voice which you slowly recognized as your own. 
And I've loved this poem since I was, gosh, I don't know, 20, 21. And, and it was like, oh, you know, I mean, I have it hanging in my house. And so like, I look at it, I, I see it every day, but it, it didn't hit me that I had other people's voices in my head until I had to push them out, including social media, mostly social media. Um, and so how, whatever we have to do in order to hear your own voice, that's what we should be doing. I mean, and not just our own voices, but the voices of people who really matter. Good, I, know, I feel like I need to apologize. I really wanted to stay in the moment. Um, we were being so vulnerable and um, in sharing with us, you know, that loss of that land and what that means and um, being able, not being able to go back. And I just, I want to go back to that just for a second. And Cassandra Perry, who asked the question, also, thank you for sharing that. Um, and I guess I just, before I move on to the next question, just want to honor that, that vulnerability, and I appreciate it so much. <laughs> and that vulnerability for sure is present in your poetry, but yeah, sorry, I want to. Uh, I appreciate that, thank you. Um, we have two more questions. Um, and uh, this is from Jonathan Duncan. What is your writing process like? Do you create a poem in a single sitting, put it aside for a while, come back to it? Do you revise your poems after you write them or leave them as they originally come to you? Um, I revise a lot. I'm never done revising. Um, I have poems that have had upwards of 30 versions. Um, I have poems that I've been working on for years and years and years. Um, revision is really important. Um, my process is, well, I, I explained this earlier to the classes. I, I'm a big uh, believer in journals and keeping a journal and, uh, and actually writing, handwriting um, and not doing first drafts on the computer. Um, I think that there's something really, really important about the, um, the connection with the hand and the ink and the paper and the something about the paper and the earth. And I just, it's, it's what I do. It's what I've always done. It's what I will always do. Write it uh, a first draft by hand. And then I'll write the second draft on the next page usually. Um, and it's not till third, fourth, fifth draft that I go to the computer and start playing with it. And I mentioned this uh, in, in class um, also. It, before that, before I had a computer, I would go to the typewriter. <laughs> and that was a lot harder <laughs> to do it, uh, with mistakes and whatnot. But um, yeah, I, was there another question in there? I think, did I get them all? No, I think you answered it, yeah, um, about revising, definitely. There's another question from someone, and oh boy, um, it's, it's Aether IPLDG, <laughs> the name of the person. Um, thank you for this evening, Lori. It's wonderful to hear your voice, reading your, vo uh, reading your voice. Can you share with us your preferred process? Um, imagine 24 free hours yawn before you. How would you uh, most likely how how would you how would you how are you most likely to spend them to come away with a new poem? Oh, that's a lot. <laughs> that is. Um, I'm. Gosh, you know it's crazy because now that we're um, in this quarantine time, um, and I teach online, um, but you know, as writer in residence at my university, I get them given the space to do writing. So I often have 24 to 48 hours of just writing time. And I'm very lucky and very blessed to have that. Um, but being at home, it's hard because I, you know, I need it's hard to be at home and to keep a, a routine. But I know that when I need to write, if I and if I have 24 hours. I will, um, I will ask my mommy <laughs> to, or, or somebody I love to um, bring me food so I can write and not be distracted. Um, usually when my children go to their father's house and I have my whole house to myself, it's much easier to write. Um, so like keeping a, keeping having all the things I need, which is basically food and a pen, and I'm good. Um, and when it's time to write, I can sit down and write, even if it means revising for 24 hours, because that is a very important part of writing. 
Thank you. Um, I'm not sure if this is Georgie or someone else, but the question is, can you explain Texas politics for us, perhaps in a sonnet? <laughs> Let me work on that. I'll get back to you. <laughs> um, and the, another comment. Hey, I wrote it already. It's called I've Eaten the Rattlesnake. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Um, from Kelly Eveleth, thank you for sharing the value of journaling on paper. I have enjoyed hearing your voice. I think we have time for one more question, if I'm not wrong, Natasha. So, um, folks. If there's no other question, we can just all unmute ourselves and uh, clap so that Lorianne can hear. <laughs> or is there is there one more, one last question? Another comment. Thank you for sharing your craft with us this evening. We really enjoyed it. Yes, thank yeah, you. So. Unmute yourselves and make a lot of noise. Thank you. <laughs> Never got that. All right. <laughs> Thank you, Lauren. We'll be in touch. Thank you all so much. It's been a real honor. Again, I wish I could be there. Um, maybe another time, though. I hope you all stay safe. Okay. Take care. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>